him, Mr. Smith. What's his name? Eastman, can you hear me? We can't hear him. We can't hear him. <laughs> I've got my mute off. Hang on. Okay, there you go. We can hear you now. Yeah. Okay, very good. Okay. Uh, can you introduce yourself, please, and tell us your, your background, please? Sure. My name is John Eastman. I'm a professor of constitutional law and former dean at the Chapman University Fowler School of Law. I'm also serving this year as a visiting scholar at the University of Colorado at its Benson Center, and, a, and I'm a senior fellow at the Claremont Institute. Um, Thank you. Uh, professor Eastman, I believe you're going to talk to us today about uh, the, the, the electoral college process and how, how that affects the legislature here. Uh, sure. Thanks very much. And uh, Chairman Lagan and the members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to testify at this very important hearing. My scholarly work and expertise have always revolved around the structural provisions of the federal constitution. Um, and because of that, similarly, 20 years ago, I was invited to testify before the Florida legislature as they were dealing with issues similar to what you're dealing with now. Um, at that time, no one had given much attention, scholarly or otherwise, to the role the Constitution assigns to state legislatures in determining the manner of choosing electors. And it's a little bit foreign to us now because we haven't really uh, done what the Constitution authorizes fully uh, for a very long time. The last time the issue really came up was in the election of 1876, and I, I don't think any of us, uh, maybe Mayor Giuliani, I don't think any of us were around back at that time. Um, but in the wake of that controversy, uh, Congress passed the Electoral Count Act of 1887, um, and which aimed to clarify some of the processes. Um, that act, too, didn't get much attention until the 20, 2000 election down in Florida. Uh, and before we really got into the intricacies of that act, the Supreme Court's resolution of the case in Bush versus Core kind of ended the matter. But since then, there's been a whole lot of scholarship done. Uh, and most of it is confirmed with, with the written testimony I gave to the Florida legislature there. And, I, and it's that process that I want to focus on. Let me begin with the relevant provision of the, of the U.S. Constitution uh, that, Ray, you've talked about earlier in your testimony this morning. Article 2, Section 1 provides that each state shall appoint in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct a number of electors uh, to which they're entitled. The Supreme Court has described this constitutional authority of the state legislatures uh, as plenary. Uh, that means it, it, it knows no other limit, that the legislature gets to do what it wants. That was in a 19, 1892 case called McPherson versus Blacker, and it was reiterated by the Supreme Court in the Bush versus Vohr case back in 2000. Uh, it even is noted that whatever provisions may be made by statute or by the state constitution to choose electors by the people, there is no doubt that the federal constitution uh, gives the right to the legislature to resume that power at any time. Um, that's again McPherson and the Bush versus Gore decision reiterated that. Um, in the early decades of our nation's history, most state legislatures selected their state's presidential electors themselves. Only after 1824 did a majority of state legislatures move toward choosing their electors by popular vote. Um, but your neighboring state legislature up in South Carolina continued to choose its state electors uh, by itself all the way up until 1860. Nevertheless, the constitutional power to decide on the method for choosing electors remains exclusively with the state legislatures. Now, to be sure, the authority to take back that power and appoint electors at any time, as the Supreme Court said in McPherson, would likely not allow a legislature to pick its own slate of electors after the results of a fair election, which had been conducted pursuant to the legislature's existing statutory procedures, merely on the ground that the legislature didn't like the outcome that the popular vote had chosen. Um, as the Supreme Court said in Bush versus Gore, when the state legislature vests the right to vote for president in its people, the right to vote as the legislature has prescribed is fundamental. But that's not the case when the existing procedures are not followed. And when significant statistical anomalies and other evidence uh, raising serious questions about voter fraud uh, and about whether the election was fair. In such cases, the manner for choosing electors set out by the legislature was not followed. The constitutional default of the legislature exercising its plenary power 
or rather resuming that power, is therefore again brought to the forefront. As the court noted in Bush versus Gore, the right to vote in election for presidential electors is fundamental when done in the manner the legislature has prescribed. Now, what you've been hearing today is a lot of uh, testimony about how the statutes that you had prescribed for the manner of choosing electors were not complied with. <clears throat> By the way, this is all uh, in, in perfect line with federal statutory authority as well. Uh, Section 2 of Title VIII provides that whenever a state has held an election for the purpose of choosing electors and has failed to make a choice on the day prescribed by law, the electors may be appointed on a subsequent day in such manner as the legislature of such state may direct. The failure of state election officials to follow the manner you had set out in statutes uh, in conducting this election, as well as the intermingling of illegal and legal ballots in significant enough numbers that the election can't be validly certified, quite simply means that the state has failed to make a choice on election day um, in accordance with the manner that you've prescribed. And the appointment of electors, therefore, both under Article 2 and Section 2 of Subtitle 3, devolves back on the legislature of the state, which has plenary power to decide whether and how to exercise the appointment power itself or craft some other mechanism to cure the problems uh, with, with the state election that occurred. That is what the Florida elect legislature was prepared to do in 2000, prior to re the resolution of that state's election controversy back in 2000. The vote on that day had been certified by the Florida Secretary of State, but the state Supreme Court had, contrary to state law, ordered a recount in only heavily Democrat counties with the expectation that that would flip the vote that had been certified. Um, <clears throat> the relevant committees in the Florida legislature, both houses, um, crafted identical resolutions that would allow the legislature to reclaim its plenary power of choosing its own slate of electors. Um, and th those resolutions passed out of the relevant committees and they were already scheduled for floor votes where they were expected both to pass when the Supreme Court issued its decision in uh, Bush versus Gore, making that unnecessary. Violations of Georgia election law here, which is to say the manner that the Georgia legislature has established for choosing the president electors are numerous. Um, as you've been hearing t testimony all day today, uh, the number of underaged uh, individuals who are allowed to register contrary to the statutory authority amounts allegedly uh, up to approximately 66,000 people. Um, 2,500 people who are convicted and incarcerated felons were allowed to vote and have those votes counted contrary to state law. Proofs of identity um, uh, uh, that are required under state law were not complied with. Voters, as you just heard, moving from one county to another uh, or before a 30-day window, as the statutes allow, were allowed to have their votes counted and cast in the prior county of their residence, contrary to state law. Um, uh, a number of voters uh, don't even have registration of residential addresses, but P.O. boxes, and have been allowed to vote and cast ballots, contrary to state law. Um, I think the biggest one is a result of the March 2020 uh, settlement agreement that was entered into with your Secretary of State and certain Democrat uh, uh, committee uh, uh, challengers that effectively altered the signature verification process for your absentee ballots in ways that uh, are contrary to state law. Those state statutes are all designed to help prevent fraud, and yet their violations now then have created a serious problem uh, with, with uh, the potential for fraud. Just on the absentee ballots itself, the signature verification process normally results in the rejection of about three to 4% uh, of absentee ballots for failing to include a residential address or for signatures that clearly do not match those on registration. Um, because of the changed procedures as a result of that settlement agreement, and that was agreement that was entered into without any involvement of the legislature, which means it was done contrary to the U.S. Constitution's authority in Article One, Section 2, um, uh, the rejection rates in this election were more like one-third of 1% with the resulting about 40,000 ballots that would have been discounted or rejected historically were, were, were allowed to be cast and counted. That's a significant deviation from the manner that this legislature has set out 
Um, these significant statutory violations are, in my view, more than enough in the way of the alteration of the legislature's approved manner of choosing electors to warrant this legislature from taking back its uh, plenary power to determine the manner of choosing electors. You could do that by calling a special election, although the time is very tight for that and may be logistically impossible. Uh, but you could also do what the Florida legislature was prepared to do, which is to adopt a slate of electors yourself. Um, and when you add in the mix of the significant statistical anomalies and sworn evidence and video evidence of outright election fraud, I don't think it's just your authority to do that, but quite frankly, I think you have a duty to do that, to protect uh, the, the integrity of, of the election uh, here in Georgia. Um, these violations combined with uh, the significant evidence of fraud, in my view, strongly support the conclusion that something is amiss here and that the legislature simply must investigate as you're doing with this hearing today. And then if there's a result of this investigation, you're convinced that the election was conducted contrary to state law, and too fraught with the risk of fraud to be properly certified, then you should exercise your prerogative to legislatively designate a slate of electors more in line with what the evidence of what actually happened on election day by valid votes uh, uh, demonstrated. Now, I also think it's important that this legislature take the action before next Tuesday, December 8th. And my apologies, I have a typo in my written testimony that I provided that said December 6th, uh, because that's when this deadline for taking advantage of state harbor, uh, safe harbor provisions in federal law, Title III, uh, Section 5 of the U.S. Code, um, uh, kicks in, um, but certainly before December 14th, when the uh, when the electors are designated by Congress to meet and cast their votes. Only by such action can this legislature protect Georgia's right to choose electors uh, for the election of president and vice president in accord with the statutory manner that you had set out well in advance of election day on no, uh, November 3rd. And it's those electors uh, that you decide uh, need to be uh, established that, will, that should be counted by a joint session of Congress, which begins at 1 p.m. on January 6th in 2021. Thank you very much for uh, your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, are there any questions? Thank you, uh, Professor Eastman. Uh, Senator Parent <coughs> has a question, and you're on number six. Yes. Yes. Can you hear, hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, good. Thank you so much for um, being with us. I'm, I find all this a very interesting constitutional um, argument. So you're, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, your argument is that essentially we have a failed election that would require the legislature to step in and assign electors, am I correct? Yes. And what do you say, in terms of proving that there is a failed election, what do you say to what's been laid out by our Secretary of State, Governor, Attorney General Barr, and, and the courts, because right now there have not been, as far as I'm aware, proof of the number of ballots that would be required to have, to have been problematic to switch the election and call it a failed election. I, I, don't, I don't know where the evidence is. What do you say to that? Well, there, there are two issues here. There's one, the extent of the fraud in the casting of ballots. And the other, which is undisputed, the failure to comply with the statutory scheme that this legislature had sent out. You can, you can say that there's no fraud whatsoever, but if the statutory scheme is not filed, followed the manner of choosing electors set out by this legislature, which has the sole authority to decide what that manner is, is not violated. It, it has been violated. Okay. And therefore, the election is invalid, even, even without any evidence of fraud. Well, can I, can I ask you, um, what, what is the statutory scheme that, in your opinion, was not followed? Well, I, I, I recited several of the provisions of the state statutes that were not complied with uh, in my testimony. I don't um, have your testimony, uh, sir. I apologize. Yeah, no, that's all right. So uh, I think the biggest one was the change in the signature, signature verification process on absentee ballots that was done as a result of a settlement agreement I'm aware that did of not that. invoke the legislature. Right. Now, the so, problem so, with that is okay. you, you had a judiciary and you had executive officials changing the statutory mechanism. The only authority to do that is the legislature. So I understand and the, the legislature argument. did not do that. I understand the argument. Can I... Can I, and I apologize for interrupting. I just want to get sort of the things I'm really focused on answered. So 
the, the Secretary of State's position is that the law was not changed. They just essentially they said this is how we're going to do it to ensure uniformity under the law through guidance to the counties, and the law wasn't changed. Well, I, I mean, I've looked at the statute and I've looked at the consent decree, and the consent decree very clearly allows signature verification only of the signature on the application for absentee ballot, whereas the law requires signature verification of both the signature on the application and the, the, the signature on file with the registration card. But, but sir, That's, isn't that, that, that what or, we did? That change from or to and is a significant okay. change. I, I do believe that we, the procedure is you, you check them both, so there's signature verification two times. Not according to the, not according to the consent decree. It says or. It says or, and that's a significant change over the statutory scheme. It's only one of the significant changes okay, but wouldn't you agree um, that, that I that, that I recite in my in my in my testimony. But would you agree that that if the procedure is that they check it twice, that that's actually preferable? Yes, that's what the statute requires. And I believe, but that's the consent what decree allows it to be checked only once. You, the statute has a double protection there. The consent decree only uh, only has a single protection. Uh, and that's a change from the statutory protection against fraud that the legislature had adopted that was not complied with. Well, I, I, you and I have a, I'm not sure that's correct. I think it's checked twice. And I think that's what the guidance said. But can we move on? And what, what else uh, was statutorily not followed that, in your opinion, resulted in a failed election? Section 21-2-216 on registration of uh, underage voters. They're allowed to do that up to six months before they turn 18, if they will be 18 by the time of the election. That was not that was not complied with. People were allowed to register to vote more than a year ahead of their 18th birthday. That uh, uh, that looks like a, more than 66,000 people were illegally allowed to register and vote in violation of that statutory scheme. Felons were allowed to vote in violation of the statutory scheme. Um, the, the, the failure to check uh, uh, voter identity um, uh, was, you know, requirements of state statutes were violated. Uh, those those violations of the state statute. And, and, let, and let me give a comparison. In, in North Carolina in uh, 2018, in the congressional district number nine, there, somebody violated state statutes by doing ballot harvesting that was not allowed under Florida law. Nobody demonstrated or proved that any of those harvested ballots had been I illegally cast by people who weren't proper voters. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, the violation of the state law was enough for the state election board to order a re-election as a result. I think the same thing has gone here with these violations of the state statutes. Well, uh, uh, and if I may very really briefly wrap it up. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm aware of the North Carolina um, situation. I think the, the difference that at least I feel is I haven't seen any evidence of any of the things that you're talking about. So we would need some sort of court intervention. We would need a successful lawsuit. We would need the state elections board to take action the way you described happened in another state. And right now what we have is in our law 212501F, where the legislature has decreed that the the candidate receiving the most votes is who the who who the electors will represent that's what we have in our law well with all due respect the candidate receiving the most votes in an election conducted in according with all the other provisions of your state election law when that was not done you don't have a valid election um, and, and this is exactly what happened in Florida when the state Supreme Court started ordering things on recounts that were contrary to state law. The Florida legislature didn't wait for a determination of a court to say our state law was violated. They made that determination themselves and passed resolution to protect their electoral votes. I mean, and, and it is their sole authority under Article 2 of the Constitution to do that. So there's a lot of fraud that even the Attorney General of the United States has not found? I'm confused. I'm sorry. And I'll well, no, 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 no you, 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 you went back to the very first point you made. There doesn't have to be evidence of fraud, although I think there's rampant evidence of fraud, as you've been hearing all day today. The ver mere violation of your state statutes is sufficient for this to be an invalid election and to return the power to determine the manner of choosing electors to this body. Senator Jones. Dr. Eason, it's Burt Jones, uh, uh, Jackson, Georgia. Appreciate you being here today. Um, and I, I appreciate you educating the members of the, of the committee here on uh, constitutional law, which I'm sure most of us needed to hear. Um, but 
with, with the argument that we're, we've been uh, presented as far as the uh, irregularities with the voting and, and also uh, the uh, consent order that our Secretary of State uh, went into as well back in March, uh, with us also having another election coming on the horizon on January 5th, with all these questions swir swirling around the November 3rd election, wouldn't it be in our best interest to try to correct these things as a legislative body before the January 5th election runoff? I, I, I do think it would be in your interest and the interest of the voters of Georgia to fix this, to make clear what the statutes say. Um, and when the consent decree, if, I've, if, if as I read it, is contrary to your state statutes, to determine that that consent decree has no validity over the operation of the legislature. The executive officials don't have authority to constrain the manner that you, the legislature, have chosen because that power is given to you as a plenary power by the federal constitution. And what the Supreme Court said in McPherson is not even your state constitution constrain your authority on that. So certainly a consent decree entered into by the Democrat Party and your Secretary of State can't constrain the manner that you have set out for choosing electors. And if I'm right that the, the, that the consent decree violates those state statutes, it's the state statute that is supposed to govern. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you being here and answering our questions. Senator Dolezal. Should have that but memorized by now, probably. That's right. Dr. Eastman, thank you for joining us. Um, I want to unpack this, this settlement agreement a little bit relative to, the, to what it changed in our law. And I think the operative word is actually any. And if you look on um, page three of the agreement, essentially what we did is we introduced no, new source material into the second signature check, right? So to, to reference what Senator Parent was saying, the, the two checks that are, that are envisioned under our code should both be checks against the file that's on, the signature that's on file in ENET. And what changed in the consent, I'm sorry, in the settlement agreement was to introduce something that the law never envisioned. It introduces into the second signature match that is on the ballot, um, the, the actual act, absentee ballot envelope, to compare that and to allow the original signature that was on the absentee ballot request form to all of a sudden become source material and that w we only now require it to match any of the voter signatures on file in ENET or on the absentee ballot application. Our law never envisioned comparing the signature on the ballot with the signature on the ballot application. So essentially what we did was we ignored the double check because what the, what, by allowing the first check to essentially match the second check, we only have one check. And the law, to Senator Parent's um, point, should have two checks against that signature that's on file in ENET. And if we wanted to change that, then we should have dealt with this in June when we were sitting in this building for, to continue our session this year, and we could have had that debate. But, but what happened here is a fundamental shift in the signature match process that was passed by this legislative body, and it, and, it, and it does fundamentally change the source material and essentially moves it from two checks down to one check. So I, I know you said that the operative word is or, really the operative word is any, that we're now only requiring a match of any signature, not the signature that the statute actually calls for. And there, there are other things in here that, that, were, um, that were added procedurally um, that may be good procedure. But to your point, and I guess this is my question, um, what, what do you view in your legal opinion as the bounds by which an executive branch member or a, a secretary or even a governor has the ability to kind of unpack and guidance and change um, sh any shall language or specific language versus their ability to kind of operate within things that are more loosely defined in the code? Well, you know, kind of clarifying what the, what they view the statute as meaning is, I think, normal part of uh, interpretive regulation. But when they change the, the the manner, and I think, you know, allowing for any signature means I could match it against your first voter registration card, I could match it against your latest registration card, or I could or I could match it merely against the application. Of course, that means if somebody is fraudulently su su submitting applications, uh, in the manner that you heard testimony of uh, just about an hour ago by by that college student named. 
Grace, and I'm sorry I don't recall her last name, that somebody submitted an application on her behalf and voted it on her behalf. Now, if the signature on that ballot when it came in had to be compared with her voter registration card, the fraud would have become manifest. But when all it had to do was be compared to the application, then the double fraud, both on the application and the vote, gets through, and she, and, and she could be deprived of her right to vote as a result. The second thing they did, they did with that um, uh, settlement agreement is the statute says, you know, a, a, a one election official is supposed to determine um, whether whether an application for an absentee ballot uh, is valid. Uh, it created a higher burden by requiring three uh, people to review it. That may be good policy or not, but particularly in light of the massive increase in number of absentee votes, what it did is induce people to, to be much less careful in the validation process that they were even doing. And it was a looser process process than your statutes allow. So I think I think on several fronts uh, that settlement agreement uh, is contrary to your state statutes. Senator Brass, did you have a question? You, he waves a question. All right. Go ahead, Senator. Thank you. I recognize you. So Professor, I disagree with you in terms of your interpretation of the consent agreement, but we're gonna kind of move on from that because I do wanna talk about the whole idea of this check that somehow it's a fraudulent check if you compare the ballot signature to the application signature. I just wanna focus on that. You are aware that under Georgia law that the application signature has to be checked against um, the original orig registration card um, or the most current update that the, um, that the Board of Elections has. Do you understand? I'm that? aware. Of, I'm aware of that as well. But but one of the allegations that has been made is that because of the massive increase in number of absentee ballots and the increased burden on county officials by going from one official to three in order to validate that check, that that meant that 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 that, that process was not being faithfully complied with, uh, which makes it even more important that the double check that your statute sets out, um, both on the front end when the application is filed, but also on the back end when the ballot is filed um, is, is submitted that it be checked against the original voter registration signature or or the most recent voter registration card on file and respectfully professor but with respect to that allegation that somehow this 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 need to increase kind of eyes on a signature to make sure that it's a valid signature that that somehow um, overwhelmed county elections offices and um, prevented them from actually able being able to do the appropriate check in terms of, of a signature match. That's just an allegation that has absolutely no evidence attached to it. Isn't that correct? Well, I, you know, I, it's been an allegation that's been made. I'm not. I'm not here to to talk about the evidentiary proof of it. What what I can confirm is that the settlement agreement doesn't. You know, the, the statute requires. The, the check against the registration signature at both phases, the application phase and the ballot verification phase. The settlement agreement allows uh, that signature verification to be done either against the registration signature or the application signature. There's a double check built into the statute. There's only a single check built into the, uh, into the, into the settlement agreement. And I think that violates state law. Okay. One final, one final. Uh, Professor, are you um, are you um, a member of the bar of Georgia? No, I'm not. Okay, thank you. I'm a member of the 11th Circuit Bar, uh, which uh, which uh, has federal authority over Georgia, and I'm a member of the Supreme Court Bar. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Thank are there any other questions? Okay. Th uh, uh, yes, yes, Mayor, please, Julianne. Um, and Rudy Giuliani, who, who does remember that election in 1876. <laughs> uh, but, um, Sorry about that, Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> vaguely. Uh, Professor, is it possible for the legislature, if they assume the authority that is theirs under the Constitution, uh, could they make findings? They could, of course. Fact, based on they could make fine, for example, based on the investigations they've conducted today. They had they had evidence presented today. They've had affidavits presented today. Assume they had fulsome evidence of three or four violations. Could they make those findings? They could, 
And, and I would encourage them if they were to take this step with the resolutions I have recommended, that they preface the resolution with a set of findings. And Professor, what presumably um, action like this will be challenged in the Supreme Court? Should they take this action or some other legislation? How do you see that argument? Well, it, it, it could get to the Supreme Court or it could um, be presented to Congress at the joint session of Congress when they begin opening the ballots and, uh, and counting the ballots. And if you have the, the governor's certified slate of electors yeah. mm -hmm. and a legislative's uh, certified slate of electors, unfortunately, uh, Section 15 of Title III is um, embarrassingly ambiguous about which of those slates of electors uh, ought to be counted. It, 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 and the 12th Amendment is also a bit ambiguous about who has the final say-so in making that determination. I think a very credible argument can be made that it's the president of the Senate as the presiding officer of that joint session of Congress. The rest of the two houses are supposed to be there to observe, according to the statute and the, and the 12th Amendment. Um, but of course, this is an unresolved issue and there's scholarship going both directions on that question. And I think at that point, uh, given, the, given the confusion of both of, of the 12th Amendment and the, uh, and, the, and the federal relevant statutes, I think the Supreme Court may very well weigh in. Now, if they do, in fact, uh, have a rational basis for their decision, either based on the law, as you pointed out, or based on factual findings as well, isn't it likely, uh, assuming that that's correct, that the Supreme Court would recognize the power that was being granted to the state in this area and give it I, some degree of deference. I think, I think based on the McPherson decision and the Bush versus Gore decision, both the majority per curiam opinion and the concurring opinion by Chief Justice Rehnquist, the late Chief Justice Rehnquist, that would be where I would suspect the majority of the court would go. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Senator Heath. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Professor. Thank you for your presentation. I'm sorry. One okay. One, one procedural problem that they have is they need to have a special session. Now, given the fact that this power that they have comes from the Constitution of the United States, is that guided by procedures that would govern Florida law? Or could they call a special Georgia session? Law. Georgia. Georgia law. Georgia law. Oh, did I say Florida? We're, yeah. we're going, we're going back, back 20 years. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. So, so I mean, we've not had that precise issue confronted like as a holding. But uh, in the McPherson case, the Supreme Court specifically said the legislature has plenary power, and even the state constitution cannot restrict that power. So if there's some provision in the state constitution that says you can't call a special session in order to exercise powers you have from the federal constitution, I, think, so. I think the federal constitution trumps that, and I think the Supreme Court's decision in McPherson supports that conclusion. I agree that it trumps it, Professor. All right. Thank okay. you, Professor. Thank Senator, you. Senator Heath, now you can ask your questions. Thank you, Professor. I'll just uh, give you a little preface here. I'm just a cowboy from West Georgia, so uh, this has been interesting. But um, I, I think the mayor just touched on the question that I was going to ask of you. So our Constitution, I believe, states that there's um, two ways to have a special session. One is the governor calls a special session for a specific list of or, or specific purpose <clears throat> or the legislature by two-thirds vote of the two bodies can call itself into session um, now this appears to be a partisan um, issue we certainly don't have a super majority in either um, party here in Georgia so am I hearing you correct that a less than a supermajority of the legislature could convene and appoint electors based on their findings of fact that the election was flawed and unacceptable? I, I, I believe so. And I, and I think article, look, the federal constitution is going to prevail over limitations on your legislative power. Those provisions of the state constitution deal with the state legislature acting in its state legislative capacity. 
but in but in deciding on the manner of choosing electors, it is not acting as a state body. It is acting as the federally appointed legislature with direct authority from the federal constitution, which of course uh, preempts the state limitations on it. Uh, and that's what the Supreme Court held in the McPherson case. That's what that's what um, section two of title three provides in, in the federal statute. Um, whenever any state has held an election for purpose of choosing electors and has failed to make a choice on the day prescribed by law, and I would say in accordance with the law that had been set out, the electors may be appointed on a subsequent day in such manner as the legislature of state may direct. Um, that's that's uh, Title Three, Section Two of the U.S. Code. Uh, I think that also prevails over any other limitations that might exist in Georgia law about when the legislature can call itself into session. It has a statutory, a federal statutory authority to deal with the issue when when the state's election has not been validly conducted. Thank you. Someone else have a. Senator Rett. Doc is Senator Rett. Just one quick question. Wait, wait a minute. Hey, let me get you cut on. Uh, two. Two. Yeah, all right. Now you can go ahead. Uh, Senator Rett, Doc, uh, just one quick question. If the uh, courts rule that there has been a s significant amount of evidence found to move forward with this, wouldn't this be in direct conflict with the judiciary? Judiciary? I'm, I, I'm sorry. If the courts rule that there hasn't been evidence of the fraud or evidence, hasn't been evidence of violations not, of the state statutes. Right. Not enough substantial evidence. Then how could the legislative body move forward? Well, so I, I think it's important to, to, to dis disaggregate two kinds of things. We're talking about evidence of fraud that was substantial enough to have affected the results of the election. Or are we talking about evidence that the state statutes themselves were not complied with? Um, and and I don't think you have to have both. I think either one is sufficient for the legislature to resume its authority under Article Two of the federal constitution to make sure you have electors chosen in accord with the manner set out by the by the legislature. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. I think that may be all of the questions. Thank you, uh, Professor, for your time today. It's been very um, enlightening. Your knowledge. Thank you, Mr. Your knowledge, Chairman, right. members of the committee. Come up here. What? Yes, I think we're going to, I think that's it. Did you have anything else? All right. Sure, go ahead. Number 12. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chairman, th uh, members of the committee, thank you so much for uh, your patience today and uh, having us today and, and all our witnesses. Um, as I said in the beginning, this, this hearing is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, as, as literally, as soon as I get back to my office, I'm signing the pleadings to file a suit in Superior Court where we will be pleading and, and proving um, the allegations that we've made here today. Um, of the irregularities and the abject failure of the Secretary of State and the counties to properly conduct the election. Um, and we believe it's impossible to certify the election results. Today you've heard and you've seen a video of the, uh, uh, what happened with the Fulton County election officials in violation of OCGA section 21-2-483B which says all proceedings of election officials are to be open to the public. And you saw them order our folks out of the room. Uh, you saw them order the media out of the room. And then they continued to order and continued to operate after they ordered everybody out of the room. You also saw them take ballots out of, from under the table and pull them out. That is a clear, clear violation of Georgia law. You heard our witnesses today testify. You heard Scott Walter talk about money flowing into 44 counties out of 159 that was allegedly for COVID that clearly was not used for COVID. You heard Grace Lemon, a wonderful young lady from the University of Georgia who did her civic duty and tried to vote and somebody took her, her constitutional right away and tr voted for somebody. In, in, you heard, and I would please respect my, my time to speak. Thank you. Um, 
you, you heard uh, Mark Amick, who witnessed illegal activities by the election officials in both Fulton County and in DeKalb County. And he had disputed te testimony of, of the Secretary of State of what did, did not happen uh, that night in Fulton County, as well as our video evidence. You heard Su Susie Voiles, a 20-year veteran who's been a poll watcher. And I, I personally know Ms. Voiles. She, she's a neighbor and, and a wonderful lady. She is about as conscientious a, a person as I've ever known to, uh, and you heard, you heard the, in her sincerity in her voice of how hard she works and how sincere she is about getting things right uh, and, and not in a partisan way, but wanting to do things in a right way and in a transparent way. And she saw these pristine ballots that had no folds um, that were all for uh, Vice President Biden. You heard Dana, Dana Smith talk about, with, again, with passion, even though it was a county that was, that was carried uh, by uh, President Trump by a large margin. She talked about irregularities. You heard about, <clears throat> you heard from Bridget Thorne, who worked uh, uh, as a subcontractor for uh, the Dominion, about how they just let these um, test ballots just uh, lie around with no security. Who knows what, what they did with those ballots? And those were the ones that, they were in the State Farm Arena. They were in the, in the State Farm Arena, the same place where they were counting ballots, and they were just lying around. Th those could have been the ones that were in those suitcases. You heard from, from of course, Professor Eastman, who talked about the constitutional uh, duties and rights. So, as I said, in conclusion, the actual result of legal ballots cast in November 3rd in compliance with the Georgia Election Code cannot be known ever not by the Secretary of State, not by the governor, not by the voting public, and not by the Georgia legislature. That's why we, the election must be vacated and can, cannot be allowed to stand. Again, thank you very much for your time and your patience today. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to call Mr. Tony Burrison now. <clears throat>